Once upon a time, this could have been a state-of-the-art setup. Santa Clara, California, March 8, 2000. Intel Corporation today introduced the Intel Pentium 3 processor, 1.0 GHz, the world's highest performance microprocessor for PCs. The Pentium 3 processor at 1 GHz delivers a 15% performance gain over the fastest processors of the market today. Quote, Intel's Pentium 3 processor operating at 1.0 GHz is the highest performance microprocessor for PCs, enabling Intel's customers to ship the fastest personal computers in the world, end quote, said Paul Ottolini, executive vice president and general manager of the Intel Architecture Business Group. Quote, Intel continues to provide the best performance today, and we have a microprocessor roadmap that will continue to keep our customers at the forefront of technology in the future, end quote. The Pentium 3 processor 1.0 GHz achieves the highest PC performance scores ever, based on today's current industry standard benchmarks. The Pentium 3 processor 1.0 GHz achieves a SPEC INT 2000 benchmark rating of 410 and a SPEC FP 2000 result of 284 versus 355 and 256 scores respectively for an Intel Pentium 3 processor 800 MHz. Using the BAPCOC's Sysmark 2000 running under Windows 2000, the Pentium 3 processor 1.0 GHz delivers a score of 188, besting the previous record of 170 held by an Intel Pentium 3 processor 800 MHz. For internet performance, using Ziff Davis Internet Benchmark iBench, using Windows 98, the Pentium 3 processor 1 GHz outpaced the 800 MHz by 14% for loading complex web pages. www.pcadvisor.co.uk slash forum slash helproom one slash Pentium 3 running temperature. I have a Pentium 3 1 gigahertz processor which has always run at what I have been told is a high temperature. I have a cooler master heatsink and fan plus two case fans, one inhaling and one exhaust. These are finely balanced and the cooler master is running at around 3,500 rounds per minute. The temperature of the CPU reports back at being 74 Celsius and reaches a maximum of 77 Celsius under stress. According to Intel CPU spec site, this processor's temp spec is at 80 Celsius. Does this mean it should run at around this temperature and so 74 Celsius would be good or is 80 Celsius the maximum temp before damage to the processor occurs? My system is over a year old and I have never had a problem but it is just the fact that I have been told that this is hot. Also, if I turn the Cooler Master up to full to sound like a jet engine, the CPU temp will not go any lower than 74 Celsius. Before I had the Cooler Master, the running temperature was 76 Celsius. Any thoughts would be appreciated.
Fields, Fisher, Sheaf, and Barrett, 1998. Effects of short heat exposure on human red and white blood cells. Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery, Volume 45, Issue 3, pages 479 to 84. Methods. Whole blood and isolated neutrophils were exposed to temperatures of 40 to 80 degrees Celsius for short time intervals, 150 to 100 and, uh, 1,200 milliseconds. Lethal injury to red and white blood cells was measured by the plasma-free hemoglobin and percent viability, respectively. Neutrophil viability was measured by tripan blue staining. Sublethal injury to red and white cells was measured by osmotic fragility and oxidative burst, respectively. Neutrophil oxidative burst was measured by chemiluminescence. Control values were compared with post-exposure values using analysis of variants with P is less than 0.05, indicating significance. Results. Lethal injury to red blood cells did not occur until exposure at 70 degrees Celsius for 300 milliseconds. Lethal injury to neutrophils did not occur even at exposure at 80 degrees Celsius for 1,200 milliseconds. Sublethal injury to red blood cells did not occur until exposure at 60 degrees Celsius for 1,200 milliseconds. Sublethal injury to neutrophils did not occur until exposure at 60 degrees Celsius for 600 milliseconds. Conclusions. The exposure of human red blood cells and neutrophils to temperatures up to 60 degrees Celsius for up to 600 milliseconds does not cause lethal or sublethal injury. A few drops of my blood are installed on an obsolete Pentium 3 processor. The CPU is powered up to its maximum permissible operating voltage, 2 volt, but it is not clocked, so it stays idle and doesn't perform any computations. But it heats up, endangering its circuits. For a short time, the heat of the chip results in the liquid of my gradually dying blood being vaporized into the room. At the same time, the vaporization also acts as a heat sink, which cools down the chip. This, in turn, limits the dissemination of the liquid. A feedback loop. According to Donna Haraway, quote, a cyborg is a cybernetic organism, a hybrid of machine and organism, end quote. This is a cyborg. However, this is not a cyborg like Robocop, the Terminator, or Ex Machina's Ava. This is a cyborg that neither techno-utopians like Stellark and Kevin Warwick, nor critical thinkers such as Haraway and Catherine Hales have considered. Instead of human bodies with agency that are extended with state-of-the-art technology, we are now considering a long obsolete machine component, arguably a piece of waste, extended with agency-less parts taken from a human body. In his book um, On Garbage from 2005, John Scanlon proposes a concept of garbage that goes beyond a literal concern with physical material. He discusses garbage as a metaphor, but also, and this is more relevant to my interest here, the notion of the garbage of knowledge. Discussing Kant's critique of pure reason, Scanlon draws attention to the vast amount of Kant's notes which have been preserved, but which were not included in the book. 
The production of knowledge is actually a process of creating garbage, discarding all those thoughts and ideas that turn out not to fit in or are not consistent with the paradigm. Now what I'd like to do is to extend Scanlon's concept of the garbage of knowledge to the realm of concepts and imagination. What we see here is actually the garbage of the concept of the cyborg. That which is actually consistent with the concept, but which has been rejected or discarded from our imagination. state-of-the-art technological artifacts in consumer culture, which Siegfried Zelinsky calls psychopathia medialis, is a driving force behind the exponential growth of the global stream of electronic waste and the persistence of exploitative working conditions in electronics production. Media scholar Yussi Parika suggests that media archaeology could be a way to critique the so-called hegemony of the new in the capitalist condition through studying and reworking the experiences and representations of newness of technologies from the past. I propose to cherish garbage cyborgs as a media archaeological antidote to Zelinsky's psychopathia medialis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. He will also give a talk tomorrow about, um, uh, help me with your title, about obsolete technology and the body. Yeah, it's <laughs> about the research project in which we went to electronic waste dumps in Nigeria and factories in Hong Kong and how electronic waste acts on the body, how it's a biological force. Okay, thank you. Are you happy to take any questions? If somebody from the audience would have a question now, or is there any questions? Yes. Um, I had a very Catholic education. Am I right that it, that helps me to understand your performance? Uh, what kind of education? Oh, Catholic. Oh, we're back to the Catholic theme. Uh, this is actually fascinating. I mean, um, Ursula uh, said that my work at Transmedial, I'll show it tomorrow, was too Catholic for her taste. Um, <laughs> um, 
I think it is, a, it is a fascinating perspective because the thing is, I'm from I'm from the Dutch Bible Belt, right? So uh, Catholicism is the enemy. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm not religious, but you know, as a cultural paradigm. So I don't think about these things. I see very well how you can read this kind of stuff very much as a, as a Catholic uh, thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah, I mean, does it help that no, you read these things differently because you are <laughs> from this background? I th but I think, I mean, I, I do, I do, of course. I mean, I am aware of it, and I kind of play with it because there is there is a sense of what I'm trying to do. There is this sense of the blood associated with life, and you're killing the blood here, like as as you know, this research basically says: if you heat it up for more than 60 degrees, it dies. The chip gets goes up to 80. So we're killing the blood, but then there is this little idea of: okay, if this is a cyborg, then. It, it is kind of alive, and that dying of the blood doesn't matter. And then there's, of course, also the kind of symbolic thing of, you know, spilling the blood on the technology. This is my blood. Na, 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 na. So. <laughs> Actually, no, I so, um, have hmm, that's true. <laughs> that's definitely <laughs> a nice avenue to, to pursue as well. Hmm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions, comments, or thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> um, then I would say thank you very much, Tani, for You're your performance. Thanks. We will hear more of you tomorrow.